sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click on the link in the description and enter promo code UNDECIDED for 85% off and three extra months for free. Let's talk about some hints that Tesla dropped in the last quarterly call for what we might expect in the upcoming Battery Day event, and how Tesla is pulling something from Apple's playbook. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. Last year, I put out videos on why I thought Tesla bought Maxwell Technologies and also dove into the details of the Jeff Don Research Group's paper about the million mile battery. And since those videos came out, there's been even more news from Tesla around their purchase of Hybar, details on the team working on Project Roadrunner, and the CATL partnership in China to supply lithium iron phosphate batteries for the Tesla Model 3 that's produced there. But more on that in a minute. All of those moves are providing pretty interesting indicators for where Tesla's big battery day announcement may be heading. However, for me, some of the most interesting hints were dropped on the Tesla Q2 call that just happened a few weeks ago. Those hints are helping to add a little context and clarity that's looking like a subtle wink and a nod from Tesla. Back in May of 2019, when Tesla purchased Maxwell Technologies, there was a lot of debate around the primary reason for the purchase. Was it the dry battery electrode manufacturing, their ultra capacitors, or a bit of both? To me, it seemed pretty clear that it was primarily about the dry battery electrode manufacturing technique. And something they said in the recent Q2 call reinforced that. The real limitation on Tesla growth is, uh, is cell production at, at an affordable price. But that's the that's the real limit. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot more about this on Battery Day um, because that, this is the fundamental sca scaling constraint. Tesla's production and sales rate is increasing dramatically, and being able to supply their car and energy business with enough cells is their biggest hurdle. During the Model 3 ramp up, they were cell starved and had to redirect production from the Tesla energy business into the car side of the business to make it happen. Batteries built using the DBE method show greater than 300 watt hours per kilogram with a path to over 500 watt hours per kilogram. By comparison, Tesla's current battery technology, which is considered one of the highest specific energies available today, is believed to be around 250 watt hours per kilogram. That means this technique could add about 23% to Tesla's current battery energy density, with room to double it. But it's not just about increased energy density, it's also about cost reduction and production capacity. The typical battery production process involves using wet, toxic chemicals to create the cathode, which then has to be dried and baked off. That involves a lot of floor space and ovens for that step in the process. With the DBE method, you can skip that step completely, which results in a 16 times production capacity increase. You're able to produce a lot more batteries in the same amount of factory space. You also save costs by eliminating that step as well for about a 10 to 20% cost reduction. It's a one-two punch for rapidly scaling up the number of cells for each factory, as well as potentially getting some energy density gains on top of that. Pair the dry battery electrode method with high bar systems that they acquired late last year, which is a company that specializes in automated assembly systems, including vacuum filling systems for lithium ion batteries, and you can start to see Tesla's automated battery factory taking shape. Which brings me back around to Jeff Don's research team that's been quietly working behind the scenes on a new battery chemistry for Tesla. Now this one is still in a black box of secrecy, but I've spoken to several people who are far more familiar with the tech and the players involved, and each one has said virtually the same thing to me. You're gonna be blown away. Now take that with a grain of salt, but I'm inclined to believe some of the insider hype I've been hearing here. This is pure speculation on my part, but I don't expect this to be a solid state battery. That kind of tech is still years away. I think an updated chemistry is going to be an evolution of where lithium ion battery tech has been heading, but it's going to be a jump in longevity and energy density. Again, this development pairs nicely with Maxwell Technologies DBE for a, what would that make it? A one, two, three punch? So I think it's safe to say that we should expect an improved battery for longevity and energy, but don't get your hopes up for a car that will go 600 miles. This is something I've been saying for a while, and I get asked about it a lot. I actually had some lengthy and lively conversations about it with folks at Fully Charged Live in Austin, Texas, at the beginning of, wow, face-to-face -face conversations. That feels like a completely different era. Anyway, I've been pushing the point of view that we should expect similar ranges and roughly the same amount of money. The big play here is scale and cost. Fewer cells in a battery pack reduces the weight, which also helps with the range, as well as frees up those cells to produce more cars, power walls, mega packs, you get the idea. To me, the following quote was the biggest hint of that on the Q2 call. I think the new normal for range is going to be, just in U.S. EPA terms, uh, 
you know, approximately 300 miles. I think 300 is going to be really, or well, close to 300 is going to be the new normal. You know, call it 500 kilometers, basically. It doesn't mean that Tesla won't offer higher end models with some crazy ranges, but those base models are going to be kept around that 300 mile baseline target. It's good for business and for consumers. It avoids the Osborne effect, which Tesla could be in danger of if they oversell the hype for this new battery technology and it isn't available across the board in every model. Why buy a Model 3 today when you could get that crazy 600 mile version sometime later? They don't want that, and we shouldn't want that either. In case you haven't heard of the Osborne effect, it's a reference to a computer company from the early 1980s that went bankrupt by overhyping a future computer that killed all of the sales for their current models. It's why I keep telling people who ask me if they should wait to buy their Tesla until after battery day. No, don't wait. If you want and need a new car right now, buy it. A new chemistry is most likely going to show up in limited models like the Roadster and perhaps the Plaid Model S. It's going to take time to ramp up and drive those prices down and be able to integrate it into more and more models. But even then, it doesn't mean that we're going to suddenly see a 600 mile Model Y. And that brings me to the final hint from the Tesla Q2 call which involves the battery partnerships like CATL. This is another reason why I'm telling people to not wait to buy a Model 3 or a Model Y. Tesla is getting more flexible by using whatever battery technology is best for their current need and job. That's something I'm actually a big fan of. There isn't one tech to rule them all. It's all about trade-offs. What we're seeing with our passenger vehicles is that our powertrain efficiency and sort of tire efficiency you know, drag coefficient, like basically all of the things that, like, you know, our HVAC uh, go, going to a heat pump, basically our, our total vehicle efficiency has gotten good enough with uh, Model 3, for example, that we actually are comfortable having an iron phosphate battery pack in Model 3 in China. Um, and, you know, and that, that'll be in volume production later this year. In China, they're using lithium iron phosphate batteries instead of their nickel manganese cobalt batteries. And LFP batteries don't have the same high specific energy or energy density as NMC batteries, but as Elon pointed out on the call, that's fine. The internal specs don't matter. It's all about the user experience. If you're able to hit that 300 mile range with an LFP battery and a Model 3, along with keeping the prices down, even though it adds a little bit of weight, that's not a problem. But in the Tesla Semi, where every pound matters because it will affect how much cargo you can carry, you're going to want to get the most energy dense battery pack that you can. Less weight, more miles, means more cargo. Being nimble and flexible like this with suppliers also means that Tesla isn't dropping their long standing relationships with Panasonic, as was rumored a while back. And the rumors that Tesla may be ramping up to produce their own batteries is most likely true given what we're seeing and hearing about Project Roadrunner, and expanding battery partnerships solidifies that. Tesla needs as many cells as they can get, so producing their own, continuing to ramp up production with Panasonic, while adding CATL and partnerships with others down the road, makes perfect business sense. Which leads me to Tesla pulling from Apple's playbook. But before I get to that, I'd like to thank Surfshark for sponsoring this video. And I know we're not traveling much right now, but I still like to use a VPN when I want to protect my privacy online. Surfshark encrypts all of the data you send over the internet, so your private data like passwords, messages, photos, videos, and whatever you're doing online stays private. That means you can protect your online identity from tracking and commercial targeting that we see with so many services today. With Surfshark's clean web, it will block ads, trackers, and malicious websites, making it safer to use the internet, even at home. One of the best parts of Surfshark is that it's easy to set up on all your devices, whether it's iPhone or Android, Mac or PC. Surfshark is the only VPN to offer one account to use with an unlimited number of devices. And whenever we do end up traveling more again, I always use a VPN when using free Wi-Fi in airports and hotels. Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. Use my code to get 85% off plus three extra months for free. But hurry, this offer is only available for a little while longer. Link in the description below and thanks to Surfshark and to all of you for supporting the channel. I know people hate it when I make this comparison, but Tesla does have a lot of similarities to Apple. And stick with me on this before starting a flame war in the comments. Tesla may differ from Apple in motivation, but purely from an operational point of view, there's a lot of similarities. Apple's vertical integration strategy centers around hardware, software, services, and retail. Owning that full stack allowed Apple to bring the iPhone to market years before the competition, or to transition all of their mobile products and software to 64-bit architectures way before anyone else also to create a smartwatch that has no real competition to this day. 
Tesla is pulling off something very similar with their vertical strategy, which also involves hardware, software, services, and retail, but adds manufacturing to that mix. But taking a page from Apple's playbook, they're opening up and expanding their battery supply chain. Because of Apple's size and scope, they're able to negotiate deals that lock up supply chain resources from multiple sources for things like RAM. Tesla is able to do something similar because of their growing size and scope. They'll be able to negotiate deals to lock up significant portions of battery production throughout the supply chain that their competitors can only dream of. And by locking up those deals at low prices, it will make it harder for the competition to catch up in a cost-effective way. I always get a lot of hate when I bring this kind of comparison up, but keep an open mind and take a look at a great article from ARK Invest on this exact topic. I'll put a link in the description, and it does a great job summarizing my take on it. My favorite bit from the article is showing Apple's revenue trajectory from when they started to claw themselves back from near bankruptcy in the early 2000s to now, compared to where Tesla has been going from 2014 to now. We're watching the next iPhone moment happen in real time here. Unless Tesla has to push battery day again due to health concerns, there's going to be some really exciting news coming out of Tesla at the end of September. We should be seeing an unveiling of Project Roadrunner, which is going to have a heavy focus on battery manufacturing and the incredible efficiencies that Tesla has been able to gain. We're most likely going to be hearing more about the new chemistry that's going to unlock the full potential of everything from the new Plaid Model S to the Tesla Semi. And we should get more details on supply chain partnerships and how Tesla is expanding its battery offering to support their growing battery needs, but also to get the right battery for the right job. And for Tesla's competition that thought they were about to catch up or pass Tesla in a spec war, they may be getting a little bit of a surprise in that front. Now jump into the comments and let me know what you think is going to happen on Battery Day. And as always, a special thank you to all of my patrons, and a special welcome to new producer Inku Kang. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I have linked to right here, and be sure to subscribe if you think I've earned it. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.